Welcome everyone. My name is Anja Rastogi. I'm the director of the PKD Center at UCLA and today I'll be giving you an overview on ADPKD, which stands for Autosomal Dominant Polycystic Kidney Disease. So uh, this is a slide showing about how to ask questions and I'll be taking some questions at the end and if I don't have enough time to answer all the questions, you can also email me after the presentation. So first, uh, a bit of epidemiology. So polycystic kidney disease, it occurs worldwide and uh, all races are affected, uh, both sexes are affected and there is no predilection for any ethnicity. And the overall prevalence is about 1 in 400 to 1 in 1,000 live births uh, worldwide uh, have PKD. So PKD is actually the most common inherited cause of kidney disease and it's the fourth leading cause of patients ending up on dialysis in the United States. So it's, it's widely prevalent. Um, and just to clarify, when we say ADPKD, there's also something called ARPKD and AR stands for autosomal recessive, which is much less common and happens in much younger population. So today our focus is going to be ADPKD and when I say PKD, it actually means ADPKD. Now, as I mentioned, this is a genetic disease. It's the most common inherited cause of kidney failure. Uh, it's inherited autosomal dominant. Uh, so there's a 50% chance of the offsprings to be affected. And as I mentioned, there is both uh, males and females are affected. Now, even though the disease is called polycystic kidney disease, so the kidneys are the main organs that are affected, but it's truly a systemic disease, multiple systems being affected, and, and they're all listed over here, uh, most of them actually. But the two that I actually would like to focus on is one is a liver cyst. Uh, so liver can get affected. Uh, it happens in less than 10% of cases, but when it does happen, it can cause symptoms. And females are tend to get more affected by, by the polycystic liver disease component of ADPKD. And there is a thought that the hormones might play a role. So that's actually important uh, if you're on birth control pills, pregnancy, um, and also if you're on any hormone replacement therapy. The other one that I want to focus on is the intracranial aneurysms. And these are important, uh, about seven to eight percent of, of uh, patients who have PKD might have uh, aneurysms, and this is something that should be screened for, especially in the high-risk population. And then we have uh, pancreatic cysts, we have diverticulitis, um, cardiac events uh, can happen. I'll be talking a bit more about hypertension, but, but they could be also valvular problems in, in uh, ADPKD. Now, this is your normal kidney, and this is your polycystic kidney. And as, as you can see, there, there are multiple cysts, and these kidneys tend to get bigger over time. So just to put things in perspective, uh, if you look at the dimension um, of, of a kidney, this is anywhere between 9 to 11 centimeters. But in PKD, this becomes much longer, and actually it can go up to 24, 28 centimeters. So this, these kidneys can become humongous. The other difference from other chronic kidney disease is, in most of the um, kidney patients, when they have advanced kidney disease, these kidneys get shrunk and they get smaller. But here, the kidneys get very big. And, and a lot of the symptoms that happen because of ADPKD is because of, of this size. Now this is just another slide showing our the, the polycystic kidney disease. Here on this side you have the nephron and what we try to show from over here is that, that this portion, the, the distal nephron, is one of the primary sites where the cysts grow and then eventually they take over the entire structure of the kidneys. And these are some of the kidney manifestations. So we spoke about the extra renal or extra kidney. By the way, when, when I say renal, that means kidney and vice versa. So renal is the other term that we use for kidneys. And here, just going one by one, enlargement is, is obviously important. Um, there is limited real estate in your abdomen. And when these kidneys get, normally your kidneys are behind your ninth, 10th, and 11th ribs, so they're protected. But once these kidneys get big, they actually grow down and into the abdomen. Uh, and you can actually feel them, the, these kidneys. And they co can cause a lot of symptoms because of the enlargement. They can cause reflux. They can cause actually obstructive symptoms, uh, pain, uh, fullness, bloating and all those symptoms are coming because of this enlargement. Hypertension is the other important uh, factor that I'll be going over. Uh, bladder infections, 
kidney stones, they are more prevalent in patients with, with PKD, function loss over time, and then peeing blood, which we call hematuria. Now, this is another picture of the kidneys being enlarged. This is your normal sized kidney, and these are your polycystic kidneys. So you can see these kidneys tend to get massively enlarged, and, and, and these cause a lot of discomfort to our patients. And, and a lot of this, this, the severity of the symptoms, when we look at, at uh, pain, hypertension, kidney impairment, there is a correlation with the kidney size. So one of the things that, that I do want to drive home from today's presentation, when we look at kidney function, we normally look at creatinine, we look at GFR. But in PKD patients, we are now looking at what we call TKV, total kidney volume. So that is the total mass uh, or volume of the kidneys as a marker of the kidney disease. And I'll be going over that in a bit more detail in, in, in a few slides. Now, pain is, is a common manifestation in PKD patients, um, and uh, it, it's, it's an entire spectrum. Some patients are, have no symptoms, but some patients actually have quite a bit of pain. And this pain, I divide them into two kinds of pain. One is the acute pain, and the other is a chronic pain. Now, the chronic flank pain, and this is where it presents, it's basically because of the enlarged kidneys, the capsule is being stretched, there's structural distortion. Uh, so this, this is chronic. But the acute pain has something that is triggering that pain. And some of the things that can trigger that pain are listed over here. One is bleeding into the cyst, which is what we call cyst hemorrhage. Infection, these cysts can get infected. They can cause symptoms. Stone, as I mentioned, our patients with PKD are more prone to form kidney stones. And tumor, a, a question that I do get asked um, uh, quite frequently, are patients with PKD more prone to cancer, uh, kidney cancer, and the answer is based on the data that we know so far, they are not. So kidney cancer is not more common in patients with, with PKD. High blood pressure, very important. So high blood pressure, uh, so PKD patients uh, run blood pressure, and actually sometimes that is the presenting sign. They go in, the blood pressure is sky high, they get tested for secondary uh, hypertension, and they're found to have cysts in their kidneys. So hyper the other important thing is hypertension is actually a marker for more rapid progression. And I'll be going over that slide too, as well. What factors actually contribute to more rapid progression of kidney failure, and hypertension is one of them. So when patients come to my clinic, it's we treat this very, very aggressively. And uh, you should talk to your uh, physician, nephrologist, uh, what is your blood pressure goal? But it's very important. So if you want to slow down the progression of kidney disease in PKD or any kidney disease, blood pressure control is very important. The other thing that I strongly recommend, so when we take blood pressure, there are three ways to do it. One is in your clinic, the other is home, and the third one is what we call the ABPM, the ambulatory blood pressure monitor in which you do a 24-hour monitor. That is probably the best one, but it's, it's not widely available. But between the clinic and, and the home, the home blood pressure readings are much better than clinic. So all a few patients who have PKD should actually purchase a, a blood pressure monitor. That would be a good investment into your own health. Now, infections are common in PKD patients, um, and this infection could be in the bladder, when we call it cystitis. Uh, it could be in the kidneys, which obviously we definitely want to avoid as much as possible. Uh, it's, it's called pyelonephritis. It could be in the cyst. And this infection is also important because sometimes these cysts are, do not communicate with, with, with the urinary tract. So the antibiotics that we choose for cyst infection should be actually looked into. And there are a group of antibiotics that have better penetration into the cyst. And then you can have abscess around the kidneys. Now, the important point about urinary tract infection is that catch them early. Most of the time, it starts from below. So, it, so it starts from below and goes up. So it's the urethra, the bladder, and then goes to the cyst and the kidneys. So we want to prevent it from progressing. So if you have any symptoms of, of which might indicate that you might have a bladder infection or urinary tract infection, call your physician, get you tested. There should be standing orders for your urine to be tested, and as soon as you get tested, sometimes I even give them prophylactic antibiotics till the cultures are back. But treating blood, bladder infections, the kidney infections, cyst infections is very, very important, and they should be treated very aggressively. Hematuria, this is basically 
uh, bloody urine, you're peeing blood. Now, the, this is cyst hemorrhage, and if these hemorrhages communicate with the, with the collecting system of, of the urine, the blood comes out, they can form clots. It's, it's also a negative prognostic factor. So if you have what we call gross hematuria, peeing gross blood, then that actually portends a worse prognosis than a patient who does not have, have the... And the differential diagnosis for peeing blood is cyst hemorrhage is one. You might have a kidney stone. Uh, like I said, patients with PKD are more prone. Infection, and once again, tumor. It's rare, it's no more common as far as we know in PKD patients as compared to the general population. Cyst hemorrhage is something, uh, so your kidney cyst is bleeding into the cyst. Once again, it's, it's, it can cause a lot of symptoms, uh, pain. They can also get infected. The treatment is mostly conservative, doing rest, um, taking uh, pain medications like Tylenol, well hydrated. Now, in, in rare cases, this bleeding could become massive. And in those cases, they actually have to get hospitalized. And sometimes we have to embolize those blood vessels that are bleeding. Kidney stones, uh, like I said, are, are common in, in, in our patients. It occurs in about 20 patients, percent of patients with AAD PKD. Uh, these stones are composed of uric acid and also of calcium oxalate or both. So these are, are the kind of stones that ha happen more. And, and the other important thing is normally when, when you have a, a kidney stone, you go and you get an ultrasound or you get a, what we call a CT scan or KUB. Uh, but in a patient with ADPKD, since the, the anatomy is distorted, sometimes these stones can, can, can be um, difficult to pick up. And also, um, the fact that this, the, the reason why they're more common is this distortion of the collecting system can cause stasis of, of urine, and, and that also predisposes um, to, to, to stones as well as infections. And in, in some cases, we might use these more advanced and invasive uh, uh, methods of imaging, so if it's needed, we have to get them done. I do tell, tell my patients, and at the end of the slide that I'll be mentioning that, to avoid intravenous contrast with CT scans as much as possible because they can potentially harm, harm your kidneys. Now, this slide is actually important, and there are a couple of points that I want to drive uh, from, from here. Um, so in this slide, this is the renal function as we measure by GFR, glomerular filtration rate, or creatinine, which is, which is another way. And this is age on, on, on the x-axis. And these are your kidneys. They're getting bigger, bigger, bigger. So as you can see, the GFR stays stable till the very end. And this is what I call the cliff. And then there's a sudden drop. So in this setting over here, the, the kidneys are getting bigger. The, the creatinine is normal. The GFR is, is normal. And, and this is kind of gives a false sense of security that, oh, I'm doing fine, I might, might test. But here is what, what I mentioned previously. The total kidney volume in this setting is more important, is a much more better marker of the kidney function and, and kidney disease than your creatinine or GFR. So other important point to take home today is when you're assessing kidney function or, in, in, or kidney disease in a PKD patient, creatinine and GFR could be misleading till the very end, as you can see over here. And then when it happens, there is a sudden drop. So our goal at UCLA PKD Center is to catch patients over here and slow down the progression. And I'll be going over some of the things that you can do to that. The other one that, that I actually um, kind of forgot to mention early on is there two kinds of PKD. That actually, it's an autosomal dominant disease. They, there are two genes that are involved. One is in chromosome 16 and the other is in chromosome 4. The chromosome 16 is called, um, and it goes for polycystin 1. It's called PKD type 1. And, and the other one, which is on chromosome 4, codes for polycystin 2, and it's called PKD type 2. Now, they behave the same, but PKD2 is milder, so and, and, and the manifestations are a bit later. So for patients with PKD type 1, they, they can end up on dialysis in their 40s and 50s, as opposed to in PKD2, it could be 70s or 80s. But otherwise, they behave the same, and as management, as far as we know for now, is the same for both type 1 and, and type 2. Now, risk factors for rapid progression. The, question, the other question that I, I do get asked sometimes is, well, what are some of the risk factors uh, that, that, that might? So being male is actually a negative risk factor. They tend to progress more rapidly. 
I mentioned about gross hematuria. If they are hypertensive, that's also the type of mutation. So there are different kinds of mutations. If there's a truncating mutation stuff, uh, they, they might have more. And then the environmental and lifestyle factors. Uh, those are important as well. So it is a genetic disease. Uh, it does tend to progress. It's a progressive disease. But there are a lot of things that you can do, and a lot of them are your lifestyle factors, which I'll be going over, that, that can s at least slow down the progression. Now, let's talk about, about diagnosis. How, how do, do we diagnose? And, and the, the, the way we diagnose right now is by a simple ultrasound. So if you look at the modalities for imaging, there is ultrasound, there's CT scans, and there's MRIs. Ultrasounds are the least expensive, no radiation, widely available and is the way we, we should test for, for PKD. And a lot of the criteria that we use for diagnosing PKD is based on, on ultrasound. The CT scan uh, is, is more expensive, but more importantly, it also gives a lot of radiation. So I tell my patients, unless they absolutely need a CT scan, they should actually avoid it, and especially if they're giving intravenous contrast. The third one is MRI. These are even more expensive, um, and uh, it, it's does give a better uh, overall reading of, of the kidney structure and, and the size and all that stuff, but, but, but it's not widely available because of cost or, or not widely approved uh, by insurance companies because of the cost. And most of the times, we do actually don't need it. Ultrasound should, should suffice. But the other important point uh, that you have to keep in mind is that when we look at the ultrasound findings or any imaging findings, we factor these things in, the age of the patient. We factor in if they have a family history. If you don't have a family history, the criteria are a bit different, and then find the number of cysts. So these three things are what we look for or, or actually address when we are looking at the, the images. Um, this is what I spoke about, the more advanced diagnostic testing, CT scans and MRIs. But the other one that I want to go over a bit is uh, gene testing. Now, the gene testing is available for PKD, both type 1 and type 2. It's, it's expensive, um, and it's not uh, completely diagnostic in a few cases as well. So, so we don't need gene testing at this point, at least, for, for uh, diagnosing PKD. The, the ultrasound images, positive family history, that should actually... Uh, confirm the diagnosis, but there are some cases in which we do gene testing in which the, the diagnosis is in doubt, that's number one, or in patients who, family members who actually have a family history of PKD and they want to give their kidney and, and we can't rule them out for PKD, then we do gene testing. So there are some indications, uh, or, and no family history as well. So, so there are some indications to do gene testing, it's available, uh, but it's not routinely recommended to be done. Now some basic tests for kidney function. One is a simple blood test. Um, you probably all guys know about that. Creatinine and eGFR. eGFR is estimated uh, filtration rate of, of the kidneys. The other thing that we do look for is protein in the urine, proteinuria. The other term that sometimes you might have heard is called albuminuria. That is albumin in, in the urine. So albumin is just a, a, a special kind of protein. And the thir third one, which I mentioned, is very, very important for a patient with PKD is the ultrasound or imaging test to assess the kidney size. Now, uh, how to manage PKD? So PKD is a type of kidney disease, so that's, that's number one. So whatever is, is actually recommended for any patient with chronic kidney disease is also applicable to a patient with PKD. But there are, are, are some, some differences which, which I'll highlight in, in, the, in this presentation. So number one is finding the right team. So it's not just finding the right nephrologist, but also the right team. Because as I mentioned, this is a systemic disease. It's, it's multiple systems are involved. And UCLA has, has one of the premier PKD centers in the world. So we, we put this together several years ago, it's doing very well. But key thing over here is a team approach. So, so it's a whole team starting from pre-diagnosis that you don't even have a diagnosis till hopefully slowing down the progression. And then at the end, if the disease progresses, then getting you to the right modality educations, including dialysis, home dialysis, and transplant as well. Now, know your tests and medications. I always tell my patients to get a copy of their labs and follow them serially. 
getting the medications, which I'll be going over in a bit more, control your blood pressure. So ask your nephrologist, what is my blood pressure goal? Now this could be depending upon uh, other comorbid conditions as well, but they should always ask, what is my goal? Is it 110 over 70? Is it 120 over 80? Uh, and be on the right medications. Not all blood pressure medications are the same, especially when it comes to kidney disease. So make sure that you're on the right medications for your blood pressure control. And this blood pressure management should be done by your nephrologist. Uh, they, they, they are the, the specialists in, in blood pressure and they should be managing things. Drink plenty of fluid. And this I do want to uh, uh, stress on a bit. So, so we always say drink plenty of fluid and, and this is something that, that we are always told drink water is good for you. But in, in, in PKD patient it's, it's especially very, very important. And, and there are patients of mine that I've sent back to, to get their bottle of water because I tell them they should always have water with them and they should be drinking throughout the day. How much? It depends upon your body size. You should talk to your nephrologist about this, but in, in an average, the, the recommendation is about three liters of water. That's what they should be drinking. Uh, and this is water. This is not soda. This is not coffee. This is not alcohol. This is plain water. That is, and in a, in a patient with PKD, I say water is actually medicine. So they, they definitely should be taking it, that. So how does p water help in a PKD patient? Number one, there is at least some evidence uh, that it actually slows down the cyst growth because it, it, it acts on, on a hormone that we call um, vasopressin, arginine vasopressin or ADH and that actually is involved in the cyst growth so it, it works with that mechanism but the other way water is important for our, our, our kidney patients is what I mentioned cyst infections or just infection in the urinary tract and also stone so if you think about s infections in the urinary tract and, and stones this water acts as a flushing mechanism so the bacteria won't stick, the, the stones will not be big enough, they'll just be flushed out. So, so water helps in that. So just to recap, the importance of water in a PKD patient, effect on cyst growth, effect on infections in the urine tract, and in stones. So those three things. So other key point to take home, reduce salt intake. And when I say salt here, I mention sodium chloride because potassium chloride is also a salt. And sodium is actually something you should watch very carefully. Most of the sodium that you take is hidden sodium. It's not the obvious sodium or, or the uh, salt shaker that you have on your table. It's, it's in, in your food, when you eat out, preservatives, all those things bring sodium. Sodium is bad for your blood pressure, it's bad for your stones, it's something that you should really be very careful about. Potassium, on the other hand, if your kidney function, GFR is, is normal, then actually potassium should be within normal limits. Low potassium actually can also increase cyst growth. Avoid high protein diet. Now this is something you should talk to your dietitian. I strongly, strongly recommend, if you haven't seen a dietitian, please go see one. Um, I'll be talking about the kidney fair that's happening on June 3rd at Santa Monica Beach. There's going to be a whole bunch of, of renal dietitians, registered renal dietitians that will be able to answer your questions if you have. But a high protein diet is, is, is potentially toxic to your kidneys and you should definitely avoid that. A plant-based diet, once again, this is where dietitians come in. A plant-based diet and what at least the way I define plant-based diet, it's not that you have to become a vegetarian or a vegan, but the portion that of your food that you eat daily, it, the, the majority of should, could, should be coming from, from plants. And the plant-based diet has been shown over and over again to be more kidney-friendly. So this is, this, is, this is just not for PKD, but it's actually for, for, for any patients with kidney disease. Limit caffeine intake. Caffeine intake actually has um, affected um, or at least in, in, in theoretically can affect cyst growth. So we, we ask our patients to limit caffeine intake. Now management, uh, avoid drugs, medication agents that are potentially harmful to your kidneys. And some of them are uh, these over-the-counter non-steroidals, Motrin, ibuprofen, all these drugs. They should be limited as much as we can. They are harmful to your kidneys, they're harmful for your blood pressure and harmful to your cardiovascular system. Uh, the other class of drugs that are getting a lot of attention are these, these acid drugs called PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. And there's, there's data coming out, there's linkage not just to kidney disease, but to other factors as well. So go over your medication list, and if you have these drugs on your list, you should try to avoid them as much as possible. 
Intravenous contrast when you do imaging study, also very important. CT scans, and this is intravenous by the way. So if you do oral, that should be okay, but intravenously given contrast. The angiograms, if you're going for your heart procedure or any other procedure, they too, if they're giving intravenously, those contrasts can, can affect your kidneys. MRI with IV contrast, especially if you have advanced kidney disease, should be avoided as much as possible. Be cautious with over-the-counter products and, and, and herbal products. And most of the times we think if it's over-the-counter and herbal, it, they should be harmless, but that's not the case. There are a lot of things that can happen, especially your kidney and liver can be affected by this. So um, some good things about, about uh, as you probably guys know, uh, the drug Tolvaptin, UCLA was a prime site for this study. Uh, we just got approved um, last month, so this is very exciting. Um, but also there are a lot of ongoing clinical trials, so if you're interested in, in participating in any of these trials, please contact us, I'll give you my, my contact information. And then we have the PKD Center at UCLA, the comprehensive center uh, that I spoke about. So this is for questions. I'll, I'll be opening up for some questions. Um, and then just a couple of things. Uh, the upcoming events, there are two things that I want to mention. One is a UCLA Kidney Fair at the beach, and the other is our, our quarterly educational program called the You Keep events. So I'll leave, uh, the next slide is my contact information. Um, this is our email, it's very simple, pkd at mednet.uc.edu. This is our phone number, and this is our, our website as well. This is actually for the core kidney program. So now um, I'll be answering some questions and thank you very much. Um, so the first question is for intracranial aneurysms, do MRIs or MRAs include contrast? So that's an excellent question. So if, if, they, if you're trying to rule out aneurysms, MRI is the best way to go. And, and since this is an aneurysm, we have to get an angiogram. We have to look at the blood vessels. Most of the time when we think about angiograms, we think about contrast. But here for MRIs, there is a way to do these MRIs without contrast. So these are MRAs, there's their magnetic resonance angiograms, but there is no contrast given. It's called time of flight. That's the way they do it. So important point, if you're being ruled out for aneurysms um, and you need an MRI, make sure that you tell the radiologist that they should not be giving any intravenous contrast, IV. Actually, no contrast is needed with this. And if there is an issue, please feel free to call, contact us at, at the UCLA PKD Center at these numbers. So, excellent question. Um, next one, can you elaborate on the Comprehensive PKD Center at UCLA? Another very good question. So, the, the Comprehensive Center at UCLA provides comprehensive care. And, and what does that really mean? All the subspecialties. So one of the biggest challenges that I see as a healthcare provider is fragmentation of care, people living in silos. Um, and this, you could be at the same institution and there can be silos over there as well. So the purpose of this PKD center was that to bring all these specialists together. And this is not just a, a nephrologist or, or a liver specialist or a cardiologist. These are people who have interest in PKD. So they all work together, they all communicate we meet on a regular basis and we try to provide the best care. So it's not just multidiscipline, it's actually interdiscipline. That means that these, these subspecialties work together to provide, and it includes everything. It actually includes other patients, which we call um, the ambassadors or the support groups, uh, the transplant, OBGYN, anything that, that can affect a PKD patient is provided. So this is, and UCLA started that actually a while ago, but now we, uh, different academic centers throughout the country actually have the PKD centers, but we were one of the pioneers in this. Next question, what does UKEEP stand for? Another good question. So UKEEP stands for UCLA Kidney Education Program. So, so one of the things that, that when I was speaking to patients, this is way after I just finished my fellowship, is, is not just lack of education, but sometimes misinformation as well. So one of, and one of my favorite saying is that your eyes see what your brain knows. So if you educate the patient and their family and the public about PKD, sometimes it doesn't matter where they go, they will get better care. And this is the basis of you keep, we have it every quarter. And um, just to go back over here, our next one, is going to be on August 12th. This is at UCLA Santa Monica Center, and it's on drugs and medicine. So everything that you need to know about drugs and medications will be discussed. We just did one on kidney disease, and the one prior to that is, was on, on, um, on transplant. And some of these videos are actually posted uh, on our website. 
And I think I just have time for one more question. Uh, can you speak more about this ears UCLA health kidney fair? So another very good question. Thank you very much for asking that. You see my green ribbon over here. So green ribbon stands for kidney disease. So how we look at pink ribbon, that's for breast cancer. Green is for kidney disease. So, so if you don't have a green ribbon, please come and get one. And you will get it free if you attend the kidney fair. So what is kidney fair? Um, I just want to spend a few minutes on this. So it's, it's a fair. And, and the reason why we, we, we call it a fair is because it's about hope. It's about being positive. Um, and one of my favorite saying is, it's not what happens to you, it's but how, what, how you react to what has happened to you will define your, your, your course. And here we have, have patients, we have their families, we have public coming in. So there's a lot of fun and entertainment. There is yoga, there's music, there are pets. We have the UCLA pack team, the dog team is over there. There's a kid knee section. Kids are, 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 have games and stuff, but there's a lot of education as well. There's PKD. So if you want to learn about PKD, this is a great place. If you want to learn more about hypertension, this is a great place. There is a full section on nutrition. Like I said, there'll be several uh, dietitians over there, registered renal dietitians, who actually will be going over what, what a healthy kidney diet is. So, so there's a run, there's a walk. It's also a fundraiser for our UCLA PKD Center. So please do come. It's on Santa Monica Beach. It's June 3rd from 10 to 2. And hopefully I'll see you there. So with that, I think my time is up. It's, it's 12. Um, I want to thank you all for attending this. I, I know it's tough. It's, it's the middle of the day. But once again, thank you very much. Um, like I said, we at UCL are dedicated to our PKD patients. If there is any questions or anything we can help with, this is our contact information. And once again, thank you very, very much.